guys here uh, wherever you are virtually hope you've got your coffee ready your energy drinks ready your popcorn ready and most importantly your minds ready to hack the culture uh, we've got a really great lineup of of activities lineup for you guys for the weekend um, and we start off this day with this afternoon with our round table session uh, which is going to be very exciting and lightning. We've got incredible speakers um, and leaders in industry, and they'll be taking us through a couple of sessions, um, which are meant for you guys, but also they're very important for you guys to jump in, uh, communicate, uh, ask questions, you know. Um, these are dedicated for you guys um, uh, so that you can learn and engage. Don't forget to join the socials um, and, in, and and join the conversation. Geek Culture for just a year now. So this is my first Geek Culture annual hackathon, which is um, exciting and looking forward to seeing what you all come up with during the weekend. Um, okay, so lots of you already know what Geek Culture is about and cool solutions and that it's also innovative and sustainable. So... Um, there's a lot of different initiatives and programs that constitute geek culture. Um, it's always changing as well. Um, so there's um, loads of different ways to get involved. Uh, we have at the moment five initiatives um, and there's 25 programs within those. So I'll just tell you a little bit about those. So first up is the geek culture community. Um, this is what the G uh, GK hack is part of. Um, so some of the programs include the um, the Female Geeks Empowerment Movement, uh, sorry, Reketetsa, um, which is about um, um, encouraging women and girls in STEM. We also have the 10 uh, top 15 young geeks um, where we nominate uh, some of the up and coming um, I, people in, in the field who are just doing great things, um, as I've mentioned, hackathons and also meetups and high geeks programs. Uh, there's also the Future Geek Stars Initiative, which is a, about um, ensuring that there's a pipeline of people um, uh, yeah, getting involved in STEM and into the future. Um, so there's a number of different um, programs, including the Back Work, which is about uh, um, giving people work experience and also some core projects like Skate Hacks, um, where we're using tech to um, make skateboards smart, um, and then various other community outreach projects. Uh, thirdly, the Geek Culture Student Society, GKSS. We now have a branch, um, at least one branch in every province in the country. And um, you may have seen these or been part of them, but these are about um, having a student society uh, for people, computer science students, um, and also giving them the opportunity to innovate on campus, but also develop leadership capacity and um, learn about running, running society. Uh, fourthly, we have the Geek Culture Makers Initiative. Um, so this one is about um, bringing together cre uh, creativity and art with um, all things IoT and hardware. Um, so it also includes information security and data privacy. So one of our hackathons, um, the Safe Hack, is also held every year and that encourages uh, geeks to consider the responsibilities around um, yeah, around building safe products from the start. So look out for that later this year. And fifthly, the provincial ecosystems. So as I mentioned, um, we have a GKSS in every province and we've also, um, we also deliver projects in all provinces. Uh, we have our own um, localized edition of geek culture in the Northern Cape, the NC Dev ecosystem which is helping to build the local ICT scene. And we also have provincial champions in all the provinces um, who help, have been helping us deliver uh, training and support for marginalized and rural communities. Um, and also helping us to lead uh, hackathons, which are, which are local. So who are um, the geeks that make up our community? So uh, as some of you may know, Geek Culture began in, back in 2013 as a Facebook group that brought together a network of mostly student developers uh, to share information on the IT industry and networking events. So this year, 2021, uh, marks our eighth anniversary. 
And Geek Culture now has a community of over 18,000 techies and innovators, uh, not just in South Africa, but also um, across Africa. So in 2021, we decided to issue a survey, the Geek Culture Community Survey, um, to help build a picture of what the community looks like now. And we received a total of 100 responses. And so we just wanted to kind of share some of the feedback and the responses we got with you. So first up, um, just to mention that, yeah, this was a sample of 100. So this is not an exact picture of, of everyone, but it was nice to see that we had um, we had some people responding from every province. Uh, Hauteng, which is where we started and where we're based, is, is still the province with the most people. Um, but yeah, we do have um, people from all over the country, which is nice. Uh, Mpumalanga is our next, uh, Limpopo is our next highest, and then Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. So if you're from one of the other provinces, uh, please spread the word. And then, um, as, yeah, as we mentioned, we've, we, a big part of Geek Culture is trying to encourage women and girls to get involved in STEM. And um, we have currently around 35% um, of the community being female, according to our survey sample. Um, so this is, this is looking good and we'd like to see it grow even further. And then in terms of age, um, as I mentioned, we started off as a mainly student-based um, organization. So it looks as though our audience is still pretty young. Um, everyone is 40 or under and the majority um, are 16 to 23, we have 45%, and then 24 to 32 is 46%, so roughly the same in those groups. And then employment-wise, um, a lot of you guys are still students, and then around 20% are um, graduates but looking for work, and around 20% are employed, and then a further 8% um, said they were self-employed. So it's still quite a big student um, community, but I think the, um, yeah, the community is also growing, and it's interesting to see that. We asked you about your hobbies. Um, coding obviously was a big one, <laughs> um, but our community has a very diverse range of hobbies, which is exciting to see. Um, yeah, it'd be great to hear more about that um, and how these passions come out during the hackathon. Um, we also asked you guys how you found out about Geek Culture. Uh, it seems like social media was um, pretty big. 60% of people found first found out about us through um, social media, which is great. And then another, um, just under a third, found out through word of mouth. Um, so thank you to everyone who's been spreading the word. And then also 4% um, first found out about Geek Culture from taking part in a hackathon. Um, and another 4% from just searching on the internet. We also asked everyone to rate out of five um, how well they understand geek culture. So we got 3.75 out of five as the average. Um, hopefully any, everyone who's seen this will get a better idea, but please do, um, yeah, please do check out our website and say, stay following our social media um, to hear more about our programs. And then 4.5 was the average um, out of five for people being likely to recommend geek culture. So that was very nice to hear. We also wanted to know from um, the community what kind of challenges um, people are facing at the moment. So that kind of helps to feed into the projects that we plan and how we make sure that the work we're doing continues to be relevant and helpful. So just a few of the things people mentioned were around um, jobs and opportunities. So getting an entry level job, um, finding an internship. Um, people also talked about getting um, better network connectivity or having machines that are kind of fast enough to help them run all the programs and softwares they need. Um, and then people also talked about um, public speaking and being in front of a crowd and um, networking. So hopefully some of those you guys can practice um, on Sunday at the presentations. And then why people are part of the Geek Culture community. So we really wanted to understand um, kind of what the value is of being part of the Geek Culture community is. And here is some of the feedback that um, people gave us. So um, the first one is because Geek Culture is the best in lifting up graduates and helping them become great programmers. 
Uh, someone else said they were fascinated by the vast experience uh, gay culture provides in terms of leadership and innovation. Also, it feels good to be part of people that understand most of the jargon you say. Uh, similarly, networking with other tech enthusiasts, learning about technology and networking with future employers, um, having more access to ICT and having a chance to learn what's happening in the work industry. Um, someone else told us that they attended a hackathon in UNISA last year and they um, were really inspired by the mentors that they interacted with who were interactive, informative and motivated and they felt that they too had those qualities so again um, yeah finding these like-minded people in our community. Um, Another person um, was inspired to create a geek ecosystem in their campus uh, to share ideas and collaborate on projects. And also um, they were keen to help build an enabling environment to female geeks, which is great to hear. Um, people told us that they find geek culture has a proactive approach to current problems and are helping institutions of higher learning streamline their curriculum with current and future technology trends. Uh, they liked Geek Culture's eagerness to digitalize the world and recode the world. So hopefully that is um, inspiring. And then um, we also asked how Geek Culture helps our community position yourself, uh, position our members in the tech space. Uh, so the posts that we have on social media, um, people feel are inspiring um, and um, helps them have a different outlook of themselves. Um, following Geek Culture helps people stay up to date with the latest technologies in the industry. Uh, some people um, mentioned that hackathons are helpful because they are able to connect and network with industry giants and innovative minds and also um, to get a better understanding of industry standards um, by getting information from software industry leaders. Uh, and finally, we did ask how um, Geek Culture can better help with career growth in the future. So people were um, keen to take part in hackathons still um, more often. So people asked for hackathons once a month and also flexible inclusion. So hopefully our virtual hackathons um, have actually made them more inclusive this year. Um, Travelling around the country, if not the globe, um, we're definitely working on that. <laughs> um, offering internships, assigning mentors to help geeks if they're stuck or learning a new language, through online assessments, um, more support forums for female geeks, um, including non-tech careers that drive from tech or the basis of tech, uh, which is interesting. Um, introducing people to data science mentors that they can look up to and be motivated by in that industry, and growing to cover other areas in the tech space. Um, so that's really uh, great feedback for us. Um, thank you to everyone who did fill out the survey. And if you guys have other ideas about what you'd like to see from Geek Culture in the future, then please do let us know. Um, so yeah, interestingly, we asked how many people had ever attended a hackathon and just um, about two in three had attended a hackathon and then 40% um, hadn't. So if and if you're here and this is your first hackathon, then um, that's great. Hopefully we'll see a, a bigger red circle next year. Um, and then, yeah, finally, we just asked how the community would like to be more involved. So lots of people were keen to, to um, you can see some of these words here, like help out more, mentor and um, teach other people. Um, and yeah, they wanted to be ambassadors and um, take part in more engagements and um, and events. So we're, um, we're yeah we're very heartened to see the enthusiasm and yeah please do follow us on social media and check the events website um, for more opportunities and we will be um, looking to see how we can get people more involved. Um, so yeah, so that's it from me. Um, we will be bringing out a report later this year. Um, but for now, I will pass you back to Misha and enjoy the round table and the hackathon. Thank you, Charlotte, for that. Uh, yeah, I had to switch off the different screen um, because of load shedding, but we still carry on. So now we're just going to hand over to uh, Keith Dumezi. Uh, she'll be taking us through the round table. We'll have an um, interesting lineup of panelists, which she'll take us through. Uh, so do sit and enjoy. Uh, for the next session.
chí Continue. Okay. So, hi everyone and welcome. Um, so, we are going to be engaging in a roundtable discussion and uh, what the purpose of this is, is just to um, align you guys with what is happening happening in the industry and so that you can get a global perspective of what's happening, um, giving you some light on some best practices and what's needed from a development perspective, um, giving you exposure to different platforms and tools, um, and just setting the cause and the tone for the hackathon with the weekend ahead. We'll also look at um, certain uh, prospects and pipelines in the African um, an innovation ecosystem and of course towards the end we'll have a question and answer session where you guys can also get some of your questions um, answered. So um, what we're going to do is we'll just start with uh, Mr. Tembi Sokumalo and if you could please just um, give an intro uh, about who you are before we get into the panel discussions and we'll take it from there. All right hello everyone uh, I hope you can hear me Yes, we can. All right, awesome. <laughs> My name is Tim Biso and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Lepster. Um, so Lepster focuses on uh, solving the challenges relating to efficiency as well as productivity in the software development space. Um, and uh, currently um, we've, uh, we've put together a program and uh, we are actually working on a platform um, that uh, will allow us to 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 to, to facilitate cross border collaborations, um, and this is to allow us to encourage more people, um, especially on the African continent, to uh, to collaborate together, to work on projects together. And uh, with on, on on this, we have partnered with Geek Culture, and we have an exciting program coming up that we'll be announcing soon. Um, but that is a story for another time. Um, our medium-term uh, vision as Labster is uh, to transition Africa into a software development hub. Um, we really believe that software development is one of the quickest and cheapest ways to innovate. So we want to encourage more people to participate in this space, and we want to help build the 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 the, um, the, 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 the platform upon upon which this can uh, can can actually be done. So um, I'm excited to be here, and uh, yeah, I look forward to to the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. We're definitely looking forward to uh, having your opinions, have, listening to your views and what you have to say about the tech space. And I'm sure everybody else is interested as well. Um, I'll now hand over to Dr. McLean Sivanda. And if you can give us an intro of yourself, and my understanding is you'll just be giving us an overview on your thoughts on the uh, African tech ecosystem. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's raining where I am, uh, so there might be a bit of some uh, background. Um, but I, I hope everyone is well and safe uh, wherever you are. So uh, by way of introduction, my name is uh, McLean Sivanda. I'm the Managing Director for Big and Global Limited. Uh, which is an infrastructure development company, and I have been involved uh, with innovation in the continent uh, for some time, going back as far as 2004. Uh, so, and I would like to congratulate Get Culture for eight years. Uh, that's a great, uh, you know, time to celebrate. Um, you guys have done amazing things, uh, 18,000 uh, members uh, and many, many lives that uh, you've been able to touch. Uh, and I come across some young people that are in tech today, all because of Geek Culture. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, Atiani, um, Michelle, uh, Kitu, and everybody else that has been involved uh, with uh, Geek Culture. And also special thanks to my former, um, you know, colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Plantinger, who also supported Geek Culture during the time that I was at the Innovation Hub, uh, as well as I saw, uh, you know, earlier from uh, CIPC, uh, uh, Mr. Pierre uh, Skunrad, you know, as well. 
Uh, bless you. <laughs> so, um, so I'm not sure, am I meant to just introduce myself or go straight into talking on what I've been asked to talk on? Uh, go straight into it. Okay. Uh, so I've been asked to talk very briefly um, on the overview and thoughts on the African tech ecosystem. Uh, and I'd like to perhaps, um, you know, put on the table five thoughts. Uh, so the first one is just looking at Africa at a glance uh, and us perhaps appreciating the fact uh, that, uh, please do let me know if there's a lot of background noise, then I might have to close my window. Um, so it's really looking at, at, at Africa at a glance and us appreciating the fact that Africa is not a country. Africa is made up of 54 countries. And each one of these 54 countries is different. It's diverse. Uh, and they are all at different stages of economic development. That is very important for us to actually appreciate. And also, there, is, it's, there tends to be a difference between Sub-Saharan Africa and, for example, North Africa, uh, which is part of Africa in any event. Uh, and my focus is really, although I spend some time in North, uh, West, uh, East, and Southern Africa, I'd like to perhaps um, reflect on what I'm seeing, particularly uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but before doing that, it, you know, one common thing right across the entire continent is the fact that it's a youthful it's a youthful continent, uh, and it's projected that even in ten years' time. Uh, over 60% of the population will still be under the age of 25. So real opportunity. Uh, and the good thing about, you know, the youth is that the youth are hungry, the youth learn uh, very quickly, and the youth see opportunities. And therefore, it's really incumbent on people like myself and, uh, you know, others that are out there and interacting with youth uh, to make sure that we encourage, uh, you know, them in whatever they're doing. So... At a glance, that's really what it is. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of activity, particularly in East Africa. So I'm going to be in Kenya in two weeks' time, uh, in fact, in a week's time. Um, uh, you know, Kenya is buzzing. Uh, a lot of hope um, and you know, a lot of startup activity. Also, a lot of uh, international uh, you know, funding coming in into Kenya. Um, you know, startups with uh, American founders, uh, you know, in essence, um, and uh, also I think the funding, you know, ecosystem is changing. Uh, government is not putting as much money into the uh, East African ecosystem as, you know, for example, the South African government is putting in into the Southern, uh, into, into South Africa. But I believe that uh, East Africa is going to be the hub uh, of startup activity in the next few years. Uh, it has not had the challenges that, for example, South Africa has had, uh, where most of the youth uh, grew up under apartheid and the education system, you know, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and I'll get back to, you know, the issues around the ecosystem, which is which will be my second point. West Africa, Ghana, and uh, Abidjan, we see Morocco as well, and Senegal, there's a lot of activity, startup activity, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of also participation by um, Africans in diaspora. And I think that's something that we need to encourage more of. Uh, and you know, once upon a time, there used to be a program uh, competition called the Innovation Prize for Africa, which emphasized uh, innovations by Africans for Africa. Uh, and, and I think it's important for Africans in diaspora to team up with Africans uh, in, the home, in, a, in a backyard home because the Africans back at home understand the context uh, in terms of the challenges that uh, we face. So Africa is not, uh, <laughs> is not short of problems, which is good because it means that we can actually innovate. Innovation comes out of, uh, out of problems. The second thing I want to quickly talk about is ecosystems. Uh, and here, in essence, we need to build you know, strong ecosystems from idea generation 
to how we provide financial and non-financial support to the role of government uh, and the role of uh, the regulatory uh, you know, environment uh, and uh, the policies and also more, more importantly, the private sector. Uh, and in my travels uh, throughout the continent, I'm, I'm finding that this is the elephant in the room. There is a private sector that is missing uh, and hence we need to develop African uh, private sector companies. So we need to actually make sure that the startups that we're working on uh, become high growth uh, businesses uh, that are endogenous, understand uh, the, the challenges that we face and they can also start to contribute towards research and development, uh, which is actually very low uh, in the continent. I think from a, a non-financial support, we're seeing more um, incubators you know, coming up uh, throughout the continent. My only concern is whether we have enough human capital uh, to effectively run those incubators and provide the support to the entrepreneurs uh, and the support that is actually very much uh, needed. The third point I want to you know, perhaps point out is really the opportunities. And we've seen uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has, uh, I think, revealed a whole range of opportunities. Much of the tech uh, ecosystem in Africa is, is driven through digital uh, and with the work environment as well as uh, also the learning environment moving virtually. Uh, and I think COVID is gonna be with us for much longer. I think there's huge opportunities for African uh, tech entrepreneurs uh, to innovate in, 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 in terms of uh, remote learning and remote working uh, you know, and so forth. And we're seeing a whole range uh, of um, you know, competitions. We're seeing you know, a whole range of other things that, that are coming up, innovations uh, you know, that are coming up. But also I think quite importantly is to really integrate you know, tech right back into the other sectors like agri. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people going into drones and agri, which we're seeing, you know, agri tech uh, that then looks at markets uh, in, in a, in a, and so forth. And I think the, the, the fourth point is really around Africa's preparedness for, for, for the fourth industrial revolution. And here I want to talk to, to, to two things. The one is, uh, I think really building up on the work that Geek Culture has been doing, uh, teaching young people to code at, at an earlier age. And secondly, what Geek Culture has also been doing very well is inculcating a culture of making things. And this is my current obsession, that we don't make enough things. Uh, we, we tend to want to use what other people have made. Uh, and therefore, we need to actually develop a culture of making things uh, and that is one way that we can effectively participate in the fourth industrial revolution by actually uh, being makers, uh, you know, of uh, you know of things. Uh, and the last one uh, is really, you know, to talk around, you know, very quickly. There's a book that I've, uh, you know, written. It's called Nuts and Bolts. It's available uh, as a on Kindle and also on uh, on an ebook. Um, but also you can find it on sibandalegacy.africa. Uh, and if, if you connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, you can also get EFT details. And in the book, in essence, I use the seven and a half years of my journey at the Innovation Hub uh, to narrate uh, what I believe are great stories. And there's a number of entrepreneurs, uh, Tiani also contributed, that actually tell you know, their own stories in terms of uh, the future, you know, of Africa and how tech, uh, you know, innovation can be a driver for economic development, uh, you know, in the future. So Africa is full of opportunities. Um, and I think all of us, uh, you know, today have got the ability to take advantage of those opportunities. The bigger question uh, is are we going to capitalize on the opportunities that we see? And if we do, for what purpose are we doing that? And it is my hope that the purpose is not solely to make money, but the purpose, the primary you know, driver of us engaging in tech innovation is to make a difference 
uh, to humanity. And through making a difference to humanity, then we can ask the question, how can we scale this? How can we uh, take some of these innovations into other parts of uh, the continent? Uh, and how can we build sustainable African businesses that can start to export you know, product into the rest of the world? And I think linked with that are the, really the opportunities that are being provided by the African continental free trade uh, area. Uh, so that agreement that, estab that establishes African continental free trade uh, 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 area talks about a movement of goods and persons uh, as being the primary driver for phase one. And the big question is whose goods and whose services and, and people are going to be moving through the continent? Is it goods that are imported from our side or are these goods that are made in Africa by Africans for Africa? And so let me leave you with that thought and uh, thank you very much. And once more, congratulations to Geek Culture and everybody that has been involved uh, with the Geek Culture team uh, and, and their journey. And we wish you many, many more years and much more impact and significance uh, than what you've been able to achieve uh, to date. Thank you. Over to you, Kitu. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. McLean Sibanda. Um, that was certainly a lot of insight into uh, where we are as Africa, the ways that we need to collaborate together and where we can actually come in uh, as the geek culture community, not only from our side, but also with the students, the graduates, um, the entrepreneurs and also um, the employed as well, as you've said about the private sector. Um, so uh, that was very interesting. We'll get a bit more into it uh, when we have more of our discussion a bit later on. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Barai Patel. You'll correct me if I'm saying your name <laughs> wrong. Sorry. You, you, you got it right. I, unfortunately, I'm not a doctor, but you got the name correct. Completely. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and then... Um, you can tell us, well, you'll give us an introduction uh, of yourself and uh, tell us a bit about what we can learn. Sure. I'm just about to, I've got a presentation here that I'm about to okay. share. Can you okay. see the presentation? It's loading. You're, okay, so you can see the presentation. Excellent. Yeah. So firstly, let, let me give a little bit of an introduction about myself able to uh, see that right okay so my name is Bayer Patel I'm the managing director of Atom Ventures and Atom CTO uh, I started my career at PwC back in 1999 so I've been around for a long while that's why I have a few gray hairs in the beard um, I started off life obviously as a consultant and I ended up working as a moving to Norway and living there and working as a CTO for a large e-commerce business. Then in 2013, I went to work for a fintech before fintech was a thing. Uh, the company had raised 12 million and we became a global supply chain finance business. And we scaled that business obviously uh, globally and ended up being on the Forbes Fintech 50 list, which was, which was great. But after that journey, I ended up uh, founding Atom Ventures. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background on Atom Ventures, we provide two main services. The problem that we've seen, or I've seen at least in the IT industry for the last 20 years has been pretty much the same in that, uh, you know, when you're starting up a business or trying to, to build technology, oftentimes people aren't able to express what they want from technology. They aren't able, you see costs overrunning, you see projects overrunning and, and we built Atom CTO and, and we build MVPs in order to address this. So Atom CTO provides virtual CTO services where we help companies and founders uh, set strategy and roadmap and actually develop their tech solutions. And then with WeBuild MVPs, we're doing a little bit of what Dr. Sabanda says and, and tries to build, try to build an ecosystem around a small business. So we give them all of the different tools and services they need as they start to grow and scale. So that's uh, a little bit about us and what we do. Um, just, uh, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was the, the way that we see the world and the world outlook and how we see technology across our network around the globe and what's what's being what's out there what people are developing in and the types of projects that either we're involved in or we know about out there now i'm going to say that a lot of companies we work with are very early stage so they're pre-seed seed 
um, Series A type companies. But they're great ideas, and there's a lot. We're we're connected into a number of different networks uh, globally, whether that's in Singapore, US, UK. So we get to see a, a bunch of different things out there. And so what I wanted to do is, you know, obviously as you guys are thinking of the ideas that you want to to come up with during the hackathon, pr I'd present some of what we're seeing. Um, but before I do that. I wanted to present something called the Gartner Hype Curve. So I, I'm not entirely sure if, if many of you are familiar with it, but I, I love this because I've seen it over the years. And and what it does is it, it it gives you an outlook of what are the technologies, what are the things out there that are being hyped. So, you know, years ago, it would have been things like gamification. Yeah, the last couple of years has been blockchain. Uh, and so as these um, technologies move through a hype curve, what ends up happening is that everyone hypes them and says, okay, this is amazing. This is the next be best thing. And as things mature, people find that it doesn't necessarily cure all the evils of the world that they're meant to cure. And there's a period of disillusionment. And then after that, you end up seeing that people find practical uses for these, uh, for these technologies. And currently what you can see is AI is what's dominating the headlines here. So the question then is, is AI, uh, is AI and machine learning actually a hype? And, I, and I'll move into that in, in a few slides further down. But what I wanted to also stress was that in 2020, there was over 300 billion in VC funding given. And, you know, even with the pandemic, what you found was there's a lot of people with money out there. And what we're seeing is that, and what we're hearing through our investor network is that there's a lot of cash to be deployed. Um, the COVID crisis hasn't been a, a crisis of finance, right? People who have had money pre COVID in, in some ways have more money, uh, some of them now. And really, what we're looking at, what we're seeing is that the, the amount of deals that are going through are still it's still good it's still numerous and the amount of and there was a little dip say in march but that dip recovered into q3 and q4 and you saw a lot of a lot of deals being deal being done and so globally over the last year was 300 billion in funding and if you look at the biggest deals they were in areas such as fintech retail pharma automotive obviously in north america you had spacex happening and so that was a bit of a skewing the market but if you look at asia it's mostly retail commercial um europe you've got medtech fintech uh, across Africa and Europe and North America, actually, you have EdTech, which is great. Some uh, South America, there's a lot of stuff going on in gaming and property, and again, in fintech. And then North America, some of the incubators that we're working with there are involved in energy, um, defense, oil and gas, uh, biotech, pharma, all of those, all of those things. So what I wanted to say is, hey, where do we see the money going? Um, and the next couple of slides are really just to kind of give you an overview and give you some ideas of what we're seeing out in the market uh, and where people are getting funding. And one of the things I really wanted to try and um, emphasize, going back to that uh, that, that Gartner curve, is, is the fact that there are th three key things that we see within the companies that we're working with or we, uh, we are dealing with in our network. That's data scale and speed. And what I mean to say by that is with data, if you if you take over the last 20 years, uh, early on, data was really an afterthought for many companies. And then as the business intelligence movement happened, as Power BI, people like Looker, Tableau came onto the market, people understood that they could look into their data and understand and get more analysis and data um, insights out of it. And so what you're seeing now more and more is that even small businesses today are very much focused on their data. So they take data from the, from the, from the in stages of when they're starting, they understand what their data strategy is going to be because they want to run even more enhanced analytics. And that's where you're getting the machine learning AI coming into it when we're looking at scale pretty much it's all about scale nowadays right investors want to see scale companies want to move as quickly as possible they want to gain as much company sorry as many customers and as much data as possible and speed so it's when i talk about speed it's not necessarily the speed of movement as in the speed of um, money moving around but it's also it is kind of speed of people being able to do things with what, whatever apps in front of them, they want to be able to get through a process quickly. They want to be able to transfer data uh, money instantly to someone else. And, and we're moving into that space. So I realize I don't have huge amounts of time. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll try and whip through some of these, these boxes here. So for example, companies that we see in edtech, edtech is, uh, those are the companies that are trying to make uh, edtech more uh, open to people that are more, less disadvantaged, aren't able to, to have access to education. We're seeing where, Things like natural language processing is being used to help students get better scores based on their responses. And um, we're seeing a lot more online learning obviously going on within the health tech biotech space. It's huge, but I think I could break that down into the companies that we know a lot about are, are in the age tech space. So there's a lot of uh, companies helping people get a better end of life experience and um, also wellness. Mental health is there. 
uh, you've got a lot of intimations happening through COVID in, in biotech and, and pharma. Uh, blockchain, we've seen, uh, obviously, there's a, NFTs are a big thing at the moment, but decentralized finance is the hot topic within blockchain at the moment. And if you guys are not familiar with it, it's worth well worth looking up. Cybersecurity, I think $22 billion was lost in ransomware last year, so it was paid out in ransom, so that's huge. And you could see that there's a lot of smaller businesses now are, are paying more attention to it, right? Obviously, the large companies are there, so you're looking at machine learning AI involved in threat detection, threat prevention. Uh, you're also looking at ways where companies are trying to secure their data and ensure that they're less uh, susceptible to attack. Fintech is interesting that we're seeing in different things in different uh, different parts of the world. So obviously with Asia, you've got uh, WeChat, Line, Grab, where you're able to pay very easily and you're able to do many things through one app. If you look at the West, uh, look at, say, in Europe, a lot of the challenger banks have come up to tr to um, fight traditional banking. So what they're trying to do there is make it easier for people to bank, get easier access to capital so businesses can get loans easier. And also people can mon manage their money better so they're able to, um, to understand where their, their money's going. At the bottom... Uh, we've got sustainability and green tech, and that's really one of the key, key areas that we're seeing now. Sustainability is big. And uh, if you can, <clears throat> recent, you know, recent results on, on certain sustainability funds are showing that they're outperforming traditional funds. So investors are really taking sustainability very seriously. Um, green tech, so smart cities, uh, circular economy, all of those things are, are, are really he being heavily invested in at the moment. And I think uh, that will only continue. So as Dr. Samanda talked about social impact, that's very high up on people's agendas now. Um, again, with remote living and working and convenience, ease of business, those are kind of things that we see a little bit that are together. Obviously, COVID has changed the way that, that we are living and working uh, and companies that are facilitating that. So in, in Europe, you've got a company called Hopin that's big, it has gone on crazy valuations recently. Um, any of those companies that are able to facilitate people doing things easily, even if it's delivery, food delivery, whatever it is, that seems to get a lot of traction. I wanted to make some honorable mentions in areas that we see as well. So again, Dr. Sabanda talked about agritech. We see companies that are using space tech and agritech together to, to look at fields and, and production yields there. Uh, we're looking at uh, image processing. So there's companies that we work with that deal with image processing to understand when uh, fruit should be picked, uh, which helps them reduce costs of labor, et cetera. Uh, cannabis was another in, is another interesting medical marijuana is another interesting area that we've looked at over the last three or four years. We've seen a number of investors moving into this space, and they're predicting that this is a, a global industry around about 24 billion, I believe. If that's uh, maybe that's just Europe, but this is again going to be a huge thing for the future. So th this is an area, and cannabis is one of those interesting areas where it touches across lots of different types of technology. So it's e-commerce, agritech, biotech, um, a number of different areas that you can use it in. So 5G VR gaming, 5G obviously is going to enable faster, you know, faster connectivity. You, you see a lot of companies taking advantage of that with a wearable space. Um, and with VR gaming, I think there's a couple of things in there. VR, there's uh, money being put into VR as a way of actually remote training, remote working, and actually remote meetings even. And esports is another area that has grown quite significantly. Um, the last thing is quantum. I put that in a red box out there because it's something I know not so much about, but again, there's vast amounts of uh, money being poured in there. And obviously, as we, I'm talking to a bunch of techies, what I thought I'd do is when it comes to some of the skills, uh, what I would say is that the core skills of .NET Java you know, and the front-end JavaScript uh, languages are still there, right? There's still high demand for that. Uh, but in amongst that, there is a DevOps component and test-driven development. So if you are a .NET developer, that people are expecting you to have some sort of DevOps knowledge, at least, if not necessarily experience. Uh, and the skills that we're seeing much more in demand are things like blockchain, uh, e-commerce developers. Um, and then there's been a, a growth in, in things like no-code, no low-code. So a lot of the stand -up, start, sorry, startup founders that we're talking to are beginning to push out their MVPs with no-code, low-code solutions. Obviously, as I mentioned, with AI and machine learning being a, a core focus, data engineering and data science is there. But one of the things I'd say around that quickly is that uh, data engineering is not just about how you deal with the data. People now obviously want you to be a little bit more involved in business intelligence. So, so there's it's an exciting time to be a techie. I think there's a lot of uh, there's there's a lot of support. There's a lot of incubators that we're seeing uh, popping up all over the place again, as, as Dr. Sabanda said. There's a lot of money being poured into technology and and globally. Given the fact that we are now more used to working remotely, there's more opportunities I think for for tech techies out there. So. I'll hand back over to you.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm in the cybersecurity industry, so I have a bit of bias towards um, that industry. I mean, this year alone has been booming and it's been quite a learning curve for the globe because it really is an equalizer when it comes to um, first world versus third world um, countries and actually seeing that some of what is deemed third world countries is doing some very innovative stuff. Um, and I just want to go back to the point that you raised about ideating being very important. Um, I just want to say to you guys that are on here is that you don't always have to create something that is brand new. Sometimes what you can do is take something that is existing and make it better. Remember, what we're always looking at is solving a problem. So when you guys are generating your ideas and looking at your problem statements, just make sure that it is something that solves a problem and not just something that is really cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that, um, Mr. Patel. Um, and we will touch base with you as well when we go further into the discussion. Um, I'll now hand over to Mr. Piers Gunrad. And um, if you could please give us uh, an introduction of yourself and give us some of your thoughts around forward thinking and uh, innovation towards changing needs. Um, I think you're on mute. There we go. Um, there you are. <laughs> I pressed it too softly and I uh, started talking to myself. Um, good afternoon, uh, Kitumetsi. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, it's such a privilege sharing the screen with the likes of Dr. McLean Sibanda. Um, I think uh, everyone in this hackathon needs to just appreciate um, the opportunity to engage with him and let me do the bit of marketing if you haven't uh, bought his book um, and uh, started reading uh, please do um, yes uh, Tiani asked me to talk a little bit about this bee in the bonnet that I have about the future um, and uh, actually uh, the previous speakers made my life uh, much easier um, and I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully you will be... Oh, um, and now I've just um, exposed my um, inabilities. Um, please forgive me, I have just opened the wrong... Um, uh, there we go. Um, as you can see, I have... Um, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, I want to start off by being a bit controversial. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a rhetorical question. Um, we all have opinions about land, about inequality, about decolonization, about state capture. Um, and I think we all in our conversations have quite a lot of... Um, discussions around what this is all about. Um, now at the CPSI, where I work, and uh, some of you may know my colleague Muzin Tombella very well, who will also be a mentor during this hackathon, um, is that's what we are all about, is um, trying to assist government departments to deal with some of these wicked problems that we are experiencing. and. Um, and that's where our path crossed with the likes of uh, Dr. Sibanda and uh, Dr. Plantinga to, to see how do we leverage also our innovators um, in terms of addressing this. Um, but the downside of these conversations um, that we have is that we are very focused on the past and on the here and the now. Very rightfully so, um, and that is one of the issues, as Dr. Sibanda has said, that um, especially on the African continent, there are issues that are unresolved, um, and there are legacies that are unresolved that we need to deal with. Um, however, we can be so focused, and some of you may have seen various versions of this cartoon, we can be so focused on the past and the here and now that we don't see 
um, what is coming. Um, COVID may look um, ominous to us now, um, but climate change may be a much bigger challenge to deal with. Um, so one of the re things that we need to start doing is to become futures literate, um, understanding that we are not only living in the here and now, we're not living in the past, but we're also futures beings. Um, many of us engage with the future in terms of our own aspirations. We want to be the next Elon Musk. We want to be the next $1 billion unicorn company. Um, and I mean, the previous speaker just spoke about where the money is going. Um, and we want to be part of that. Um, and we also get caught up in the whole 4IR hype. Um, I love this um, cover of Forbes magazine dating back to November 2007, um, talking about Nokia and the 1 billion customers that they have, uh, with the very interesting subheading, Can Anyone Catch the Cell Phone King? Um, that was just after the release of the first iPhone, and we know what happened since. So uh, we may be... Um, thinking in a certain way, shaped by our current realities and may not be seeing what is on the horizon um, if we are so guided by our own aspirations. Um, but have we ever considered that we are knowingly and unknowingly colonizing the future? Um, or that our futures are being colonized? Um, we, we've seen, and people like uh, Dr. Marivati has done quite a lot of studies in this regard, how biases in our data that we are using, even for these hackathons, are already um, coding the legacies of the past into the future. So when we are talking about decolonizing, have we ever spoken about um, the future being colonized as we speak. And then the question is, whose future are we going to live in and will we have a say in that future? Um, the OECD has done a couple of studies. Um, we've just seen where the money is going into uh, future companies and uh, that the industry is looking at and that Wall Street will be looking at um, if we are saying the future is in the making, how would that future be looking? Uh, and as I've been saying, is the, the OECD has looked at a few future scenarios, um, and there can be the scenario and sometimes a combination of these um, as looking at empowered individuals in a multilateral world, um, which is probably one of the ideal scenarios that we want to. The question is, when we engage with technology and we engage, what kind of uh, scenario are we playing into? A second scenario, which we've seen quite strongly coming through because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, is that states become a platform, or that there is... Um, I don't want to use the word collusion, um, but there is very close cooperation between states and private sector entities in terms of providing certain platforms where um, especially data from citizens are then uh, used for uh, various purposes. Um, are we seeing global tech platforms becoming the new world order. We have just seen what happened with WhatsApp and Facebook. Um, we have seen all the conversations about data privacy um, and the power that many multinationals have, even over things like uh, national elections. Um, so how strong are the corporate connectors becoming? And then what was also mentioned previously is what are the hands of artificial intelligence and enabled um, worlds? So um, when we become futures literate, we are starting to see not only what is happening in my own environment, but also what is happening globally and in whose hands um, we are almost playing. Or as Dr. Sibanda was so importantly saying, um, 
what about Africa's future and Africa taking control over its own future? And to be quite honest, and, and I hope um, I will not be ostracized for this, um, uh, Kitu, is um, my experience on the continent is that East Africa and um, countries, despite some of the um, uh, issues around democracy in countries like Rwanda, but East Africa is much more aware of taking the future in their own hands um, and building a future that is not dependent um, on external factors um, by becoming um, the next um, uh, global superpower, if I can put it in that way. Um, there are talks about Africa providing uh, the youth benefit for the world um, and so on and so forth. And this hackathon is part of that. Um, and the question is, how do we look beyond um, just the challenges that we are facing currently as a country, as an individual, and looking further so that we become part of this continental move, we become part of um, changing the world for better. Um, and, and what does that mean uh, within the context of a hackathon? Um, and just a couple of, of quick comments. And, and perhaps uh, if we can do one of these during this hackathon, um, I would be very happy. Um, when we look at our immediate future, uh, we've already seen the slide on hype cycles. You know, where do you fit into any of the hype cycles, such as the Gartner hype cycle? And, and are you ahead of the curve? Is what you are doing behind the curve? And if you are behind the curve, what are you doing to either change your direction or finding something unique in terms of a niche? Um, have you read, if you, for example, what the context where I'm coming from, if you want to develop a solution for government or for service delivery, have you read the strategic plans of a department so that you can understand in which direction are they going? Have you read the relevant chapter in the National Development Plan or did you read the African um, plan um, uh, towards 2063, uh, the future we want. Um, we've already seen slides on where the money is going. Um, one can look and follow the money to see uh, what makes sense in terms of the investment. Um, we must see the elephants in the room, the, the things nobody wants to talk about, but they are there to solve, they are there for the taking. We need to beware of swans, black swans that we've read about now because of COVID, or jellyfish that just suddenly blooms in the ocean and it's all over the place. Um, but the one that I want to come back is, um, are we stress testing our solutions? Are we asking questions about what if someone else come and take my solution? What if I'm on the wrong path? Um, what if I'm on the Nokia path and not on the smartphone path? Um, and those are the kind of questions, and I think during this hackathon that is a question that every team must ask, is let's put our um, solution under stress testing. The airline industry perfected this uh, before a plane can fly. It undergoes all sorts of stress testing to see if it can function properly under severe conditions. And this is where the term comes from. And then lastly, looking ahead, looking 20 years ahead, looking 30 years ahead. And that's not that easy because we need to start understanding trends and emerging issues. But one of the things, and, um, and I think I will get the full support of Tiani in this regard, um, is about reading, 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 including science fiction, so that we can start thinking about where the world is going and what's happening in people's heads. And then, very importantly, understand how systems work. What are the emerging issues? What are the trends? And what are the manifesting problems of the future? Um, and in what direction is this going? Um, I'm not going to explain this slide, but this is, in essence, what the landscape we need to navigate um, as innovators. Um, this is a, a um, 
an approach that uh, is being taken by the uh, uh, TIPC consortium, uh, consortium of those in national systems of innovation. Our own Department of Science and Innovation is also involved with this. And it's simply talking, uh, without explaining a lot, is we need to understand what the landscape is that we're operating and that there are various trends. And the trend that is now at the top is not necessarily the trend of the future. But this does uh, present certain challenges. Um, there's an existing regime, a regime that we all have opinions of, um, which I've mentioned in the first slide. Um, in terms of technology, in terms of policy, in terms of where industry is. Um, but that regime has to interact with what we are doing. And that is bringing these niche solutions into the regime, into the mainstream. Um, and that's where we need to understand um, how our solutions fit in into a global world. But that's also where we need to build that resilience because you cannot expect that the existing regime would be positive or always be positive about what you are doing because in essence you may disrupt uh, the very comfortable existence of people like myself or my colleagues um, who are within uh, a certain environment. Um, and that's why you need to understand this so that you can continuously strategize in terms of dealing with this. Um, and I think those are my slides. And um, coming back to um, the discussion, um, and let me just get back to um, unsharing my screen. Um, and stop presenting. Um, thank you very much. I, I cannot go into the whole um, subject of uh, futures thinking, but there are things that are emerging and um, there are possibilities and opportunities. And um, Dr. McLean has mentioned some of these, uh, Mr. Patel has mentioned some of these, and I'm sure Mike is going to talk about a million microgrids which is another huge opportunity um, that we need to look as, uh, at as innovators. Um, Kitu, thank you. I think with that, um, let me hand over to the other speakers. All right. Thank you so much. So um, I remember um, Mr. Skunrad being at the CPSI uh, conference in 2018, and I actually did a presentation on using hackathons to drive service delivery. And I'm very excited at the extent of um, collaboration that's actually come up since then between Key Culture and um, the government or certain government services with them actually using um, the platform to say, what do young people think about this? And um, what solutions are they actually identifying? And sometimes we hear of some problems that they identify that we may not have thought of. So it's actually been a very interesting era. And um, I remember Dr. McLean saying, there's a gap in the private industry, um, but we can talk about that offline. I have personal <laughs> comments about that. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, I'm going to hand over to uh, somebody that's going to be um, uh, on our panelists as well, Mr. Terry Zelane. Um, so uh, if you could please just give us an introduction of yourself and you'll be uh, giving us your opinion on the enlightenment on the summit in the year um, of the elections. So I'll hand over to you. And when you're ready, you can take us through that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kitu, and my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm glad to be seeing my old friend here, my clean. We used to work together in the Department of uh, Economic Development in Gauteng. And I really enjoyed uh, the presentations that uh, you guys uh, have made. Uh, let me start firstly by saying I am an election administrator. I was with the Electoral Commission for about almost 20 years. Uh, I've participated in quite a number of uh, platforms internationally. I serve in an organization called AWEB, which, we, uh, which I really uh, established uh, together with other people. 
a website for Association of World Election Management Body, Bodies, our head office is in Korea. Uh, I've been part of election observation groups uh, for many years. I've led the African Union in Ecuador as well as uh, in the Gambia. And when I left the IEC, I then established uh, this organization called IMSA. And the reason why I established this organization, it was largely because I was seeing a gap uh, in the market and I was also disillusioned by some of the uh, programs that I had observed, uh, both at an international level as well as at the local level. So I established this organization basically to make that intervention in the electoral space. Now, as you all know that uh, the elections and democracy in general um, is uh, in, 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 in almost everywhere in the world, um, you find people who are supposed to be teaching people about uh, the democracy issues and vote education. It's a person with a, a pack of uh, papers uh, sitting in a classroom and telling people how to cast a vote. And it does not really help a person to, it does not empower a person. It takes the agency out of the person uh, to be able to participate in electoral processes. But there are quite a number of things uh, that are happening. And also, uh, perhaps before I do that, uh, you know that also the political parties, every time when they think about having to reach out to people, they rely on rallies, they rely on door-to-door -door, um, campaigns. Now, obviously, uh, the situation has changed. And it's not only COVID that has changed the situation. It's quite a number of uh, other processes that are already uh, underway. And when we thought of a summit uh, that was going to be uh, looking at democracy, elections, uh, big data and artificial intelligence, we were basically saying to ourselves, we've got to try to look at the gaps that are there and then develop innovative ways uh, of reaching out uh, uh, to people. So this was also motivated by the fact that uh, there were quite a number of events that were happening. I'm sure all uh, that when Donald Trump came into power in 2016, um, there was uh, a, 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 a rather, the, it was not just a belief, but uh, indeed uh, Cambridge Analytica had actually mined information from social media to basically give Donald Trump um, an advantage. Uh, leading up to Brexit, again, Cambridge Analytica was involved in terms of swaying people's opinion uh, into, a, into a particular direction. There is also a belief uh, that uh, the events in Latin America in the past few years have not just been a spontaneous reaction of uh, people, in, but it has actually been uh, information manipulated in order to produce a particular result. So we thought then uh, we've got to have the summit that is then going to begin to look at these issues uh, properly, to try to understand exactly uh, the effect of big data and artificial intelligence uh, in electoral uh, uh, democracy. Uh, the issue which was of concern to us was, unlike in the past when uh, the, the freeness and fairness of the elections was determined by a simple thing of looking at whether the ballot boxes have been uh, preloaded with information or not, uh, the new environment within which we are operating has created a completely different arrangement. Now, if information can be manipulated and the electorate can be manipulated using big data and artificial intelligence in the manner that it's happening, then what is free and fair elections? Uh, can we still continue to say uh, the elections uh, in, uh, in the US in 2016 were free and fair in the context of what we know? Uh, following uh, what we know about Cambridge Analytica. Uh, can we say that uh, the electorate all over the world, they are not being manipulated? Or is this just uh, a marketing uh, program? Uh, is it just, uh, you know, an advanced way of marketing services to people using information that uh, people have? So we are trying to basically interrogate this through the summit uh, that... Uh, uh, we are organizing. 
But we also realize that there are quite a number of issues that uh, are uh, impacting uh, on uh, the summit itself. And therefore, we decided to uh, enter into conversation with uh, UJ, with uh, Gig Culture, with HSRC, uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation, to basically say it is better if we actually uh, put our uh, hands together to try to understand uh, this terrain. And we, we then thought the, the hackathon that we are having today uh, will also be part of the processes that are leading uh, to the summit that is uh, planned for, for November. But in addition to that, we also decided on monthly webinars uh, where we are looking at issues associated with the subject of the, of the, of the summit. Uh, for instance, um, last month we had a, a, a webinar that was focusing on regulation and deregulation, regulation versus deregulation of social media uh, uh, in elections or in a democracy. Um, and, 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 and then we are hoping that uh, the next subject is going to be focusing more on electronic voting. And after electronic voting, we're looking at cyber security. Basically, the, the, our, our topic then is going to be Uh, hacking the vote, uh, cyber security in, in elections. So we're looking at all these issues as a build up uh, to what the summit that we will we'll have uh, in in um, in November. So some of the things that uh, we should be looking into, for instance, uh, it's also how we can use the new technologies um, uh, to advance the electoral democracy project. Uh, to what extent can we use uh, psychosocial and uh, psychographic analysis using AI uh, to basically understand the market properly and then be able to shape uh, information without necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, abusing uh, uh, the system? Um, we're going to be looking at, for instance, uh, also the issues of social media in the elections, but also how the political parties can begin to use the new technologies uh, to basically reach out to the electorate. You know, it was very interesting uh, looking at the events in Kenya uh, in 2015 when the elections uh, were uh, nullified. Uh, because uh, we have, every time when we've got the elections, quite a number of people who are coming as election observers. Uh, these are people who've got a piece of paper who are moving from one station to the other, uh, trying to check as to whether the elections are free or fair. But now something very interesting happened in, uh, in, in, in Kenya. After the election observers had declared the elections free and fair, the court nullified. And they nullified that because the election observers could not actually go through uh, the electronic mechanism through which the elections were being uh, delivered, uh, the, the election results were being delivered. And they did not understand how um, the irregularities could have happened um, within within that that context. So basically, these are some of the things that we're going to be looking into. We're looking at the issue of access of information. Who is providing us, uh, who is the source of information these days? Uh, and then what is the source of information? How do we confront fake news? How can we basically use uh, the new platforms uh, to basically uh, ensure that... Uh, uh, the electoral uh, democracy uh, project uh, is intact and is protected and is still relevant uh, for uh, our societies. Let me stop there. I will deal with the issues of uh, uh, questions when we come to question time, Kitu. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, um, Mr. Zelani. Um, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you that this will be an interesting year for the elections. And as you've said, not only because of COVID, but also because of the advances in technology. And as we all know, um, although technology increases efficiency, it also introduces a great deal of risk that uh, we must be ready for. And we always have to try to catch all the balls and play out all of these possible scenarios just to get that right. Um, 
So um, thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Kumalo, Dr. Sibanda, Mr. Patel, Mr. Skunrad, and Mr. Zilane. Um, I'd like us to now get into a discussion all together where we can have a conversation um, with certain questions that um, I have on my side. And as we've said, we'll get into um, the questions uh, that uh, might be coming from uh, people that are with us in this event. So um, I'll get straight into it um, because of looking at uh, the time. So um, Mr. Uh, Zilane, as you've just uh, completed uh, presenting now and your presentation is probably the freshest in everyone's mind, um, where are the opportunities to innovate in the, electro in the electoral space uh, in 2021? Well, essentially, every aspect uh, within the electoral cycle mm. um, uh, provides an opportunity. Um, mm. You know that uh, now uh, uh, registration um, could not happen in certain instances, largely because people could not gather. Uh, it means we've got to develop uh, new registration methodologies where people do not necessarily have to go to a registration station in order to be able to register. And I'm glad that uh, the provision within the Electoral Act, uh, which used to require people to present themselves uh, at the voting station or at the registration station, uh, no longer applied, has been repealed. So mm -hmm. there is a possibility there. I have indicated as well uh, uh, that uh, voter education will have to take a completely different turn. We're going to have to use new technologies uh, to try to reach out to the, te to, to the electorate. Political parties can no longer rely on uh, the rallies, as I've suggested. What can we do for political parties in order to enable them uh, to reach uh, the electorate? We're going into 2021. Uh, there's been rumbling around where people have, some of the political parties have been saying, how can we continue to have the elections in 2021 when we have not had an opportunity to campaign? So what are the kind of the methodologies that can actually be used and the technology that can be used to empower the political parties uh, to participate. The issue of electronic voting uh, is a very important one, and we've got to, again, uh, be innovative. But perhaps before I talk about electronic voting. So even the voter education program uh, that the IEC or civil society organizations and upon uh, would have to be, uh, people would have to think thoroughly about new methods mm -hmm. uh, that uh, can be used uh, to uh, empower people about information and and, 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 and also deal with the issues of uh, 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 fake news in social media. What are the kind of technologies that can be used to detect uh, uh, fake news? How do you tell the truth from, uh, you know, uh, falsehoods uh, in the context of proliferation of uh, all these uh, 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 platforms that we, we currently have. So electronic voting, I was talking about it, it's another opportunity. Uh, but as you were saying earlier, uh, with uh, the electronic voting also comes also other challenges, issues of cyber security and all uh, associated risks. What are the kind of the innovations that we can come up with that will actually uh, minimize uh, those kind of incidents? Uh, those are some of the issues that I thought, uh, you know, uh, we could try to come up with some innovation around them uh, in the space of electoral democracy. Hmm. And uh, Mr. Skunrad, do you have anything to add on to um, that statement? Uh, thank you very much. This time I unmuted first. Um, uh, I, I think the the opportunities are legal. If you if you think about the public sector as a whole, it's about one third of the economy of this country. Um, so it means it's about one third of the market. And <laughs> I think we've lost him. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll give him an opportunity to answer again when he gets back. Um, I guess I'll get on to uh, the next question and I'll direct that to you, Mr. Patel. Um, I mean, the job market will never be the same again. And um, I want to know from you, what has the world learned? And um, also what your views are 
on the traditional recruitment journey of organizations when looking for tech talent? Okay, so I, I can speak to what I've seen in, in Europe. And I think one of the, the main things that I've seen with businesses here is that people now are less scared of, of managing remotely. So one of the key things, I think, when the pandemic hit, especially in this country, in the UK, people were very, very scared of how can they manage resources remotely that, that are working from home. And I think now, year on, everyone's realized that the, the company hasn't exploded and you know the world hasn't fallen apart and they're able to do these things. And I think that's that's the key, which also in many ways democratizes the, the tech landscape because it means that now companies who were not necessarily thinking about bringing their tech resources off, like taking it offshore or nearshore, are thinking about them being able to do that. So we have seen more companies more interested in finding resources outside of, of the UK and Europe. However, I'll caveat that with the fact that it's still a, a minefield, really. I mean, we do employ people around the world. Uh, and what you have to understand is the cultural sensitivities. There, there, there are, It's different ways of managing people in different countries. And I think that's something that still needs to be learned. But I think... Um, I think now is a, is a great time again, as I said before, to be a techie because I do believe that people are more open to to finding resources in different countries and finding the best resources in different countries, right? So it may well be that you find that you're paying a lot of money for a certain type of resource in the UK, but you can find something even better uh, anywhere else in the world. And I think when it comes to the actual recruitment process, uh, what you do see is a little bit more of the online testing going on, right? So there are a lot of more companies coming up that are doing online testing. I think there is obviously a lot less of the in-face, face-to-face. That will still happen because I think that's still important for, for cultural fits. But more and more companies are doing everything online. And, and actually, it, we do a lot of video interviews in the sense that we get them to re- people to record videos and, and bring them into us because I think that's, for us, is quite an efficient way of doing things. But it also helps people feel more relaxed when they're, when they're answering some set questions. So, yeah. Mm, I definitely agree with that. And I think, uh, especially in the tech space, people are just becoming more welcoming of... Um, understanding that the traditional education um, doesn't necessarily always work. It's still the safe way um, from a recruitment perspective, understanding that somebody has followed a certain path through, but um, especially in the tech industry, um, experience is certainly starting to pivot into becoming more important than what you have, um, I guess, on paper formally. (laughs) Um, Thank you for that. So, uh, Mr. Skunrad, you dropped off. Um, We had a tech issue, um, but we definitely know that Murphy's Law and Tech, you know, they have a pact. I I do (laughs) apologize. I'll be very quick so that uh, Dr. Sivanda can make his input. Uh, There's definitely opportunity for a stable 5G connectivity. Um, <laughs> which I just suffered from. Um, so there's a there's an idea for the for the hackathon uh, team. Um, no, I just wanted to say that in the public sector there are huge opportunities. But um, you know, I must say, at my young age, I, I'm still learning quite a lot. And I recently um, watched one of these Discovery Channel. Um, documentaries or programs about undercover billionaire Um, and one of the things that one of the billionaires said uh, stuck with me because that's the problem that I think people like Dr. Sibanda, uh, Dr. Plantinga and Muzi and I are struggling with is um, how do you get your solutions into the public sector and one of the things he said is find your client first and then develop a solution. And that's something I would like to share with um, with the hackers, is start thinking about who's your client, what do they need, start building a relationship, and then start developing a solution that fits mm-hmm. the need within that specific context. Um, there are wonderful solutions that are needed, um, but they are not necessarily always appreciated, and they're not necessarily always welcome. Um, and that's the one um, issue that I would like to add uh, to the team. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Ketu. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Sibanda, you were the chosen one to be next. <laughs> so, um, what I have to ask you is, I mean, Africa is often referred to as the dark um, place or this dark planet and what are some of the shifts that you're seeing that um, signal light in Africa? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Jack. You too, and also very good to see my uh, old brother and good friend, uh, Terry, um, and uh, doing amazing work, uh, I think, in the electoral system. And I think one of the things, I think what, uh, you know, Terry is very humble, uh, but uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of innovations that uh, him and his team are implementing in the continent. I mean, we, we're chatting on a flight to Kenya, uh, and, uh, and and I think Africa will rely on technologies um, and, and IP that comes out of uh, institutions like the one that he leads, uh, because they understand the context uh, in which uh, Africans are actually operating in, uh, which is a very unique, uh, you know, in a, uh, in a context. And so I think, you know, looking at the shifts, I mean, we're seeing a lot of shifts. Uh, but before I talk about the shifts, I must I must lodge a formal complaint uh, that uh, there are no women on the panel other than the moderator. So that is something that we need to address uh, in, uh, in future, uh, because one of the shifts uh, that we're seeing in the continent is an increased participation of women in tech. And that for me is very important because women are multipliers. Uh, and I mean, this week we celebrate, uh, you know, International Women's Day. Uh, and what I found working with women, you know, founders is that uh, they, you give them something, they'll multiply it, you know, for sure. Uh, and so I think we need to really, you know, support more and more uh, women tech uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the, 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 the second shift is really, I think, one of Africans realizing that the future of Africa is in their own hands. And I think the African Continental Free Trade uh, you know, Agreement is one, uh, is one specific uh, you know, uh, event or uh, you know, incident that actually gives uh, um, you know, evidence you know, to that. The fact that we must trade as Africans, uh, and and I think we're seeing even in international discussions, Africans take you know coming together uh, to talk with one voice, and I think aligned with that is also uh, the you know Africans are starting to solve their own problems. You recall, I think when COVID started, um, you know the pandemic started and the lockdowns. Um, you know, the supply chains were, were disrupted, uh, you know, and so forth. And in essence, I think many Africans have had to actually innovate and start to look at developing uh, local uh, supply chains. We've seen solutions locally, uh, developed solutions, uh, uh, to, you know, coming up uh, to be able to counteract uh, the, uh, the, the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic. I think the last one is uh, infrastructure. Um, and I think linked with infrastructure is, is perhaps to talk around, you know, the funding uh, that is coming to, you know, to Africa. There's been a massive infrastructure build. But however, what I'm seeing more recently is not just African countries building infrastructure. I mean, in Kenya, they built, um, you know, a train uh, from Mombasa, you know, into uh, the SGR into in, into Navasha uh, just after you know the Nairobi, uh, but they didn't have anyone to operate it, and in essence they had not really thought through in terms of why do they need that 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 particular you know rail, um, and you know and so forth. But increasingly we're seeing African governments thinking through about integrating infrastructure to economic activity. Uh, and, and hence linking the funding that's going to infrastructure with specific economic activity. And therefore, my last point around the funding is Africa is up for grabs. Everyone is coming, you know, to Africa. The war uh, between China and the U.S., in essence, is being fought over, you know, Africa. Uh, because, you know, increasingly, you know, the U.S., China is putting in more money, uh, and the U.S. is not happy about that. Uh, and I, I think last week there's an announcement: France is also going to be putting in more money. Uh, and the big question really is um, is really around African governments being selective because this money is not is not a grant. Most of this money is becoming concessional loans, 
the bigger question is do we need loans or do we need equity uh, in, in, you know, in Africa? Uh, and so we're going to have to choose very carefully. And I mean, one of the things that I say in my book is that innovation and not aid uh, is the answer uh, to, you know, to Africa's future. Thank you for that. Indeed, very insightful. Um, I think I'm going to get into um, the nitty gritties and going into the software development side of things and looking at the right practices and uh, grooming young talent. So, Mr. Kumalo, um, how would you describe a software developer in uh, 2021 and how are they expected to embrace change? Uh, hi again, everyone. I hope you can still hear me. Yes. Um, so the job itself of being a software developer is one that is extremely dynamic. Um, things that are in fashion now or like skills that are highly sought after right now, um, that will not be the case in the next coming five years. Uh, that, that landscape changes very quickly. Uh, but one thing I'd like to point out in particular that's been a major change, especially in 2020 leading to 2021, is the place of work. Um, when you think about it before, um, I, you know, I've known a lot of software developers out there that worked for companies and they would wake up in the morning, um, commute to work, go work in the office, come back home, uh, do something else, etc. cetera. Um, but that's, that's changed completely now where a lot of companies have actually found a source of digital transformation from the challenge of COVID-19. Um, so what's now been happening is that more and more companies are suddenly realizing, well, we can work from home, right? Um, just like uh, Mr. Patel was saying, I think he, he did this, this subject a great deal of justice. Um, and and this, this is now creating a, a quite, a, quite, a, quite a, a big change in the industry in, 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 in two ways, really. Um, and I think the, the first one is that um, it is a big opportunity, right? Because all of a sudden, um, the companies that would only hire in a specific geographical area um, can now start to hire in other countries as well. Um, which means that if you are a geek or if you are a hacker somewhere um, and you're looking for opportunities, your pool just grew um, and, and you can start tapping into new territories uh, for those opportunities. Um, and, and you can really compete um, among other people that are situated in all corners of the world. That is the first thing, um, which, which I can put as the positive aspect of this. Um, but one thing to also take out of this that I would regard as a bit of a challenge, uh, that something, something that uh, people need to actually prepare for, is that now that companies can hire just about anywhere, it means you can no longer refer to yourself as I'm the best software developer in Johannesburg or I'm the best software developer in Africa. All of a sudden, you're in competition with the entire world, which means you have to force yourself to kind of become a global citizen in, that, in, in, in just the way that you look at things. Um, software development uh, or just the software industry is, 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 is one of those industries that is um, largely unaffected by what's happening within specific jurisdictions. Um, so, and, and that, that, that causes this, uh, you know, um, this, 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 this flow around the globe of uh, current of changes that basically impact the entire industry. So what I would really say to, um, uh, to, 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 to uh, you know, in answering this question of uh, what, what's really changed uh, in terms of software development in, in 2021 is that um, we are seeing a gradual change in an ideal software developer for someone that is hiring developers or someone that is looking to, um, to, to collaborate with developers. The first thing um, that I would like to just outline as something that is becoming somewhat of a requirement is the industry is now looking more and more to people who are uh, self-starters, um, people who um, you know, do not only thrive under supervision, but people who are able to actually uh, use their own um, 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 
uh, you know, run in their on, on on their own steam and go out there, find new things, learn new things, uh, equip themselves. Because all of the water cooler conversations we usually have in the office space have suddenly changed, and that can present new new challenges in in the in the way that we share ideas, um, and and that will take some time for 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 for, for people across different in industries really um, to adapt to that. Um, so that is that is the first thing. But the second thing, as I mentioned, so um, is the discipline. Uh, working from home has a lot of advantages, as a, a lot of you would uh, would attest uh, right about now. Um, it's fantastic, but also um, it presents a new way in which we can start looking at how people are performing their duties, and also how do we evaluate people. So if I'm if if I'm the if if I'm someone who's employing developers, like for instance in my case, where my team is completely distributed and has been since 2018, um, and Taking this decision to run a distributed team meant that I have to start focusing on different things other than whether someone is sitting on their chair or not. Um, I have to now start looking at things like, um, you know, what is their output, what is their throughput, and, and, and things related to outcomes rather than the effort that people are putting in, because all of a sudden you no longer have the oversight. So now to you as a person, as a developer, you need to have a great deal of discipline to make sure that you can still thrive in an environment like this. Mm. Just the second thing is uh, versatility. Um, you know, this field is changing a lot. And as you can see, um, you know, new advances in technologies are coming for just about any, 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 any industry that we have on earth. Um, and software development is also amongst uh, some of them. Um, so, you know, you have to look at, um, you know, how you can adapt such that your contributions to an organization or to a team or to, you know, to your own ambitions remain relevant. And being able to do that means you have to start thinking about things in a very different way. Um, instead of only really focusing on being an, a, speci a specialist in something very specific, which is not a problem on, on its own, um, but consider that that thing that you're an expert in um, may not be around in the, in, in the next two years or in the next five years or even in a decade. Uh, what then do you do? Um, so it's important to really abstract your role and start thinking about things on a strategic and creative level such that you are then able to add value in multiple um, of these facets uh, within within either an organization or in the context in the context of um, of, of collaboration. Um, and just the last thing in tying this together, um, so we, the culture and labs that have entered into a partnership uh, to really start making some more progress in this specifically where we are looking to, um, you know, to onboard uh, developers into a program where they will be collaborating with other developers situated in different parts of the world working on, on, on the same project. Um, this can be a mix of junior developers and senior developers sharing skills, really solving problems. And this is one step that we can take towards really creating, um, you know, this culture of creators and people that can come together and solve problems as a unit. And I think this gives us a platform for a very good transference of skills among people sitting in, 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 in different areas, which would otherwise be subject to, um, you know, infrastructure difficulties or infrastructure differences and really a general access to, to opportunities. So um, I think, yeah, in 2021, things have changed in a slightly more uh, drastic way than we've been seeing, um, you know, in, in, in the past couple of years. Mm, you raise a very important point about um, the fact that we're almost competing now at a global level, actually. So I have uh, a friend of mine that was recently recruited by an organization um, in Johannesburg, um, but uh, he was just told to come and fetch his machine and go back home because they haven't even allocated a desk to him at all. So it's not even about having the option to sometimes go into work or not. We're actually shifting more in the direction of remote working being the preferred um, um, method of work. And so that's when your technical skills and your soft skills actually become very important because not only must you be good at um, 
completing your tasks and doing your work, you also have to be good at managing yourself and being able to communicate and um, changing the dynamic of what working in teams actually means because we're working in teams, but we're not seeing each other. So what the impact of that actually is. Um, I'll go over to you, Mr. Patel, and ask um, for anybody who's interested, I mean, what kind of an employee is a CTO looking for in 2021? Hello? Hello. Sorry. <laughs> I was on mute. Um, I think you, you and Mr. Kamala have, have said a, a lot a lot already. I think I agree with 100% with everything that you're saying. I think the things for me to add really are that trust is fragile, right? So back in the day, you would be obviously able to talk to people, understand what's going on in their lives, you could see what's happening, right? And you can't do that when you're when you're working remotely. So as you mentioned, communication is the key. And if you if someone in a management position suddenly feels that that trust is lost, that that can escalate or de-escalate quite quickly. So it's important to have communication lines open. It's important not to try and game the system in any way. If you aren't able to do the work on time and you know your output is going gonna, is gonna to suffer, you need to be upfront with those things. And I think for us, uh, when we look to hire, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, at the very beginning of COVID, when we were hiring, we found that people were working two jobs because essentially they just assumed they could work during the day for one company and then for, at the night for another company, right? And it quickly, you quickly realize we're not idiots. So, you know, everyone, you all realize quite quickly that someone is not doing the kind of work and they're not responsive at the right times. And just because you can't see them doesn't mean you suddenly trust them. And I think that's one of the uh, the, the key uh, key elements. And I think what uh, Mr. Kamala said was, was really interesting in that, you know, you, you've, it, the world is opened up, right? And you're able, as you said, your friend, you can go and you can go and work from anywhere. But and, and in, a, in a good way, your pay can increase because obviously that means that people are able to pay more. But that is a double-edged sword because then people are demanding more, right? right. And as Mr. Kamala said, it's not just about being great at you know being great, being a great React developer, great .NET developer. You have to be able to then understand, you know, even architectures, microservices, understand how to work with containers. It's there's there's an additional layer. That people are looking for now because there's so many more people accessible on on the market uh, and i think um i think really for from my perspective the one thing to emphasize is, is just that more human side right it, it, it's important that if you aren't a great communicator because not a lot of develop not you know developers aren't always the best communicators but it's at least trying to push out your personality to the people that you're working with, right? In, in the, in the best way that you can, so that we can at least understand what is happening, what's going on. And if you're struggling, it's not a situation where you just sit and do nothing. You know, you go out and reach out. And I think a lot of what we look for are people who are open to self-improvement and self-development, even if it's not anything to do with technology, they're interested in doing other things. We look to support them in their side projects or in their side, uh, in their side kind of enthusiasm, simply because if you don't, that's where you want a well-rounded person in and because you can't speak, see one, ev everyone every day, you need to find what their interests are. Then you need to be open and tell people, right? And I think that's that's the key. I think that's all I can add to what you guys have said. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just looking at the time and um, I'm going to try to um, get through as much as possible in the time that we do have. Uh, Mr. Delaney, I'm going to go um, back to you and um, I want to talk a bit about voter education and your opinion about whether or not we are doing enough to educate the masses. Well, uh, I don't think we're doing enough. Um, and I'll tell you what the problem is. I've indicated that uh, the programs that are there for food education are merely programs that are aimed at helping a person uh, to be able to cast a vote. And does not actually help a person, it does not empower a voter to be able to make a decision uh, during the elections whether to vote for a particular party or not. We're not teaching a voter to be able to read the manifestos and to assess and analyze the manifestos of political parties. Uh, so we basically just, in a very rudimentary way, helping people just to be able to hold a pen and cast a vote. Mm -hmm. And that can be sufficient. But also now, uh, because of uh, the uh, proliferation of all sorts of platforms, 
question is whether the voter education program is moving uh, with the times, whether we are taking advantage of the platforms that are there to be able to reach uh, uh, people, you know, I mean, how many uh, programs uh, are being, uh, you know, uh, 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 facilitated through either social media or any of the platforms that are there? Um, you hardly really find um, a, a organization, I'm not talking about the EMB, so election management bodies, I'm talking about even uh, as, uh, as civil society organizations. I don't think we're doing enough. I think there's a lot that we can do. And I think uh, the effect that we're having this kind of uh, discussions with uh, people who are experienced in terms of uh, the new technologies using software, using developing certain platforms, that would help in terms of empowering people to be able to deal with information at their disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so um, before we go over to questions from um, the attendants and participants, um, please can we just get um, uh, uh, closing remarks from you guys in terms of uh, uh, advice that you can give very shortly to our participants. Um, I'll call you guys out just so that <laughs> we don't have everyone talking at the same time. I know how excited you all are to give those tips. <laughs> so um, we'll start with you, Mr. Kumalo. What can you say um, as a tip for our participants? All right. So um, I wish I were you right now because this is very exciting. Um, but just like any other project, uh, there's really four things that you have to keep an eye on during a hackathon. So the first thing is the scope. Uh, make sure that you can manage your scope. Once you've decided on the problem that you're working on and the, and the solution that you, uh, you are implementing, keep an eye on the scope. Uh, don't start introducing new features that are unnecessary. Uh, the second thing is obviously the time. You have a limited amount of time. So have someone who can keep an eye out for that and just making sure that you are, you are keeping yourselves in check regarding how you are utilizing that time. Um, and in normal occasions, there would be then the quality of the work that you are doing. Uh, I would lean more towards just making sure uh, that you are clear about the problem that you're solving and you are well articulated in the solution you are, you, you are proposing and therefore make sure that you are working, uh, the, the stuff that is that is addressing those two things um, is of an acceptable amount of quality for a hackathon uh, such that you are also able to, if, if you want to evolve this uh, um, this this uh, this project further, you are able to pick up from there knowing that you, you've, you've, you've nailed it on the head in terms of the fundamental things. Um, and the last part of things, uh, do not overestimate your own bandwidth or your own abilities. Um, the amount of time you have may seem long, but it's very, very short. Uh, so make sure that you are properly utilizing uh, the time that is uh, that, that you have, especially in relation to the personal uh, or the human resource that you have um, at your disposal. So um, try and have some 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 diversity in the team if you can have people that can play a role of um you know product owner that can oversee the whole process do it um and just have fun uh, it's 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 an exciting time but i would like to just encourage you to look at the problems that you can take on forth as a, as, as a solution to a real problem um, and you know a lot of us and, and, and a lot of people stakeholders in these types of events are looking for solutions coming out of these events so it'll be good if you can work on something that on Monday morning or Tuesday going into the you know to the rest of the year is something that you can take and work on and hopefully not just to win the prize but actually to solve a real problem but have fun <laughs> thank you for that um, mr kumalo over to you dr sivanda yeah so i think uh mr kumalo has covered a lot of ground <laughs> So, uh, my, you know, my advice would be, you know, focus on, you know, the problem. Um, and so as you work on your solution, keep on uh, checking, are you still addressing the same problem? Uh, and also ask the question, um, what pain uh, will the end user uh, need to go through to engage with your solution? 
uh, because if they are going to uh, have to make huge adjust adjustments, uh, chances are the solution will not be applied. Um, you know, people are looking for things that to make their life easy. I think more importantly, and most importantly, above everything else, have fun. You must have fun and make it count. That's the second have fun, guys. So definitely yeah. have fun. <laughs> Mr. Patel, tips and tricks from you. So someone once said to me, in your 20s, you build your skills. In your 30s, you build your network. And in your 40s, you use your skill in your network. So I think don't forget, I mean, to network while you're there, right? So have fun, learn some new skills, but also network. Thank you so much. And Mr. Skunrad? Yes, fun above all others um, as the first one. And so just enjoy it. Um, secondly, play to your strengths, but learn something new. Um, so use what you have um, to your own benefit. Um, thirdly, play the long game. If you take three hackathons to develop your solution, it's fine. Um, play the long game and make sure that you build something that you love. And lastly, uh, don't assume. Challenge your assumptions every time. Just don't assume that you understand the problem well enough. Uh, ask more questions. Dig deeper. Do more research. Um, and then lastly again, have fun. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of fun that's going to be had mm -hmm. in the second <laughs> Mr. Tilane. Uh, the electoral democracy space is pregnant with possibilities. It is relying on old methodologies. So whatever interventions that uh, you will be developing will really be able to help us in terms of uh, taking forward um, you know, the, 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 our electoral democracy. So, yes, like everybody says, they must have fun, but uh, you've got the ample opportunities out there to be able to make an impact in our society. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So, um, because everybody's so excited to start, um, we'll only take um, from the participants, and both of them are from uh, Mabu Manailing, um, so the first one goes to um, Dr. Sibanda, and uh, um, they want to know what your view is on government's appetite for adopting technology and how the South African government compares with other um, governments in Africa. Yes, I mean, uh, Pierre, um, some are indirectly refer to this. The challenge with the South African government is, I think, the, there's willingness uh, but the the ability is lacking. And much of it is really around the procurement laws. Um, and I'm more inclined to actually say that it's the interpretation of the procurement laws as opposed to the actual procurement laws. Uh, because when one comes up with an innovation, you can't expect it to go out on tender. It just does not make sense. Uh, the South African government puts in a lot of money into um, innovation programs and so forth. It would make sense uh, for it to perhaps even enact uh, a, preferential, a preferential procurement uh, legislation in respect of uh, innovations that have been funded uh, by government uh, in one way or another, just to give access to market. We've heard that government is a huge market on its own. Now, in the rest of the continent, um, I think the rest of the continent is actually looking at South Africa. Um, I mean, Kenya, I'll be in Kenya in a week's time, so I'm also going to be spending some time with some guys at Konza who are doing incredible work. And part of the question that I'll be asking is, to what extent uh, have the innovations that have come out of the hackathons that they've been having uh, since the start of uh, the COVID pandemic been taken on board, uh, you know, by government. So I guess, you know, they must keep, uh, you know, a watch uh, on my blog uh, and uh, some of my tweets. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Sibanda. And actually, the next question is for you, Mr. Skunrad. So um, the question is, wh what is the role of technology practitioners in um, helping government move fast? And essentially, what's your general assessment of um, government's relationship with technology is? 
Um, that is a very loaded question. Um, uh, I, I think when we speak about government, it's the same way as Dr. Sibanda referred to as Africa. Africa is not a country. Government is not the same. Um, so you will find pockets of excellence. You will find areas where you will just feel you give up. Um, so there are areas where technology is playing a leading role, um, the IEC being one of those. Um, and there are departments where I think you will have better access than others. Um, and these vary um, tremendously. Um, so I think there's a huge role for uh, technology um, practitioners to come into government uh, to help improve processes. So the areas of business intelligence uh, is basically unexplored. Um, uh, we, we still struggle with the three IR issues in terms of fully digitizing um, government records. Um, so think about hospitals and file management in hospitals and those kind of things. Um, so the one difficulty with government is that the thinking has always been we get a big tech company to come in with a big solution and that will solve all the problems. Uh, and one of the things that I think we need to all partner in because it's not the uh, the, the current thinking, and that is that many small players together can start solving much of these challenges. And I think that's the space for innovators to come and play, that we start building modular solutions that will tackle some of these big system problems from many angles. And I think that's where uh, technology practitioners, but let me, let me close by saying technology is not the solution but technology must enable people to solve their problems. Um, so play the people game first, and then bring in the technology to, to provide an enabling um, environment. Um, <coughs> thanks, thanks, Kito. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, this has been an incredible session. Um, and uh, before I hand over to Misho for the what the actual heck session. Um, I just want to give my two cents to all the participants, which is use your mentors, guys. They are mentors that have been allocated in the hackathons. When you find yourself stuck, when you find yourself having questions, when you find yourself needing help, whether it's from a technical or non-technical perspective, reach out to your mentors. And if you haven't been allocated a mentor, shout out, we'll definitely do that. No team is without a mentor. So um, right now, I'll hand over to Misho with what the actual heck. Thank you. Muted. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for, for the great session, Gaito, and all the different uh, panelists. There was definitely a lot of information that was shared with learning, with taking notes of. Um, and it's exciting. Um, it's really great content. And, and some of the fit is things that you guys can take all, take along with uh, post hackathon. Um, the recording is available on YouTube for those who might have missed it. Uh, please just uh, do have a look at it. We are about to jump into the actual hackathon, the main, main parts of the hackathon. Um, and this part is where we'll be introducing you guys to what the hackathon is about. Um, what will be happening, and if you have any questions around that, uh, we'll be taking you um, through that. So please just, uh, just give it a minute, and we'll jump right straight into it. I'll just be presenting the presentation for you guys. Sorry about that. All right, hope everybody is, is excited for the hackathon. 
Um, it is the first uh, virtual geek culture hackathon. Um, we've had the previous ones where we'd meet face to face, you know, get to see some of you guys dancing, uh, you know, hacking on the ground. But um, unfortunate circumstances, we are doing this one virtually. But it will still be exciting nonetheless. Uh, and I'll just jump straight into taking you guys through what we'll be doing uh, and also just sharing a bit of the, the program for the next couple of, of days. All right, so this is the annual Geek Archer Hackathon. Uh, for those who are not aware, it is a 42 hours hackathon uh, where you guys are challenged to work on challenges that are presented to you uh, using different tech tools. Some of the tools are, are provided to you as resource pack. And um, you know you form you form the team of six members, and um, to, so you can have it work on your own, but at least form a team of six members. Some of you have already formed teams. Those of you who have not yet formed the team, the process is still in 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 in, in motion uh, on Slack. So do hop onto the Slack channel so that you can be allocated a team, or so you can find the team for yourself. It is advisable that you work with a team instead of alone, uh, because hackathons are not just about the hacking part, it's about networking and learning from others, but also sharing um, a bit of your your knowledge with others. So let me just quickly introduce the different partners that we have. We've got, um, as you can see on the screen, we've got Top Code, uh, yeah. RS Components, Atom CTO, Im IMSA, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing it properly, Africa's Talking Policy Action Network, HRRC, uh, UJ, Labster, Angel Hack, CPSI, uh, so Plyke, and uh, we've got some great support from the Geek Culture Student Societies, um, which are also there to, to, to be helping us. So thank you very much to all the different partners that we have um, that have made uh, this hackathon possible uh, in different forms. So they've contributed in terms of um, the different resources to make this possible, uh, and some of them have provided mentors, which we'll touch on in the next session right now. All right, so we are going to go to the to introduce you guys to the mentors, right? So we've got the mentors um, on the chat uh, on, on the call right now. Um, they will be joining us and just giving us a little brief brief about who they are what they'll be all about and uh, you know how can they be assisting you guys. So on Slack, we do have a dedicated channel for the mentors. Uh, so you do have access to mentors throughout the weekend. You're not hacking on your own. Uh, please do not be afraid of asking questions. Ask as many questions as possible. Uh, if you're new to the hackathon, don't be scared of asking. You're not bugging anyone. Uh, just be in touch with your different mentors uh, you know, who will be around on Slack. Uh, they are eager to help you guys out. Uh, they are they're really burning to just share as much knowledge and guide you guys uh, through the different hackathons. So I'll just quickly introduce the, the mentors. Um, let's see who's on the call. All right. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Mabu. Uh, please, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Michel. <laughs> My name is Mabu. Um, Manai Leng, and I'll be mentoring throughout the hackathon, uh, specifically focusing on Python problems, machine learning, data science, and uh, everything in the context of artificial intelligence and, and, and. So happy and very excited to help the guys. Just one ask, please harass me. I have a lot of experience of being a mentor and being bored. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to your, your harassment because I'm I've cleared my schedule just to help you guys. So please harass me. Thank you. All right, keyword there um, is harass him. So that's the thing with the mentors. As mentioned, they've dedicated their time uh, for you guys to help all of you uh, with your solutions to help guide you um, throughout the process. So please, please, please do bug them as much as possible. All right, next I'll hand it over to Mr. Bernard Mashala. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Bennett Wena Mashala, and what I do, I actually look after infrastructure and operations. However, recently I've been doing a bit of um, learning uh, 
the language R, which uh, it is very exciting. However, obviously, with me as a mentor engaging with uh, with hackers, I'll be getting an extensive, you know, experience about how this language works and how other services that you guys have, you guys as participants can use during the hackathon. And like Mabu um, indicated that please abuse the mentors because we come from different types of background in terms of technology. So one of the programming skills that um, I know a bit is c .net, ASP.NET, and obviously your HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, all of it. As I have indicated that I will be learning from other hackers. So I am excited to be working with everyone. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Um, then we've got uh, Mr. Excellent, Mr. Viso, Mr. Kumalo. Hi, everyone. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, yes. So my uh, my experience is in. So I'm a also like a full stack software developer. Um, so uh, that ranges across uh, multiple things. But if anyone is working with uh, Python, uh, GoLang, um, uh, JavaScript, um, I'm more than happy happy to advise. Uh, apart from that, uh, I'm also happy to assist with any problems relating to uh, maybe the architecture of your application. Um, and yeah, um, so yeah, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kumalo. We've got Hilani Baloi. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Hilani. Okay. Um, so my name is Hilani, as mentioned. I currently work for BOC Group as a solution engineer. Um, so generally, I'm a software developer, and I well, basically work as a full stack developer for and been for a few years. And um, I'm happy to be of any help um, in this area. So currently, I've sort of like really been working mostly on JavaScript, but that's not a limit. Um, I'm happy to to help. Um, and if I don't have an answer, I'll definitely get someone who has an answer for you. So definitely reach out anytime. I'll be here for to help you. Great. Thank you, Kilani. Um, then we've got Lamaine Cruz. Uh, Pugan. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? My name is Lamaine, Lamaine Pangan. Um, I work at, uh, at I represent Topcode. Um, I head up the, co the commercial department there. So when it comes to right from the design, the build, and the actual going to market, we are a full, full stack development, uh, software development house, and uh, we're here to assist you throughout the entire journey and uh, the entire journey of your innovation. So, um, yeah, please reach out, guys. All right. Is, you heard, guys, do reach out. Uh, we've got Lerato. Is Lerato here? Okay, I'll just um, go to the next person for the time being. I've got uh, Mike Barker here. Good evening, everybody. Right, so I'm an electrical engineer and energy engineer with a focus on green tech, things like Internet of Energy, Energy IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, I've got a lot of background knowledge on engineering, especially in the sustainable uh, world, the future world of climate change. I'm hoping to help you with business processes, use case development, and then I've worked quite a lot with collaborative software, online collaborative software platforms, and I can maybe help you in that area. And uh, when it comes to coding in particular, I'm going to hand over to the to the younger members. Uh, thanks. Thank you. All right. So welcome. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Dumela. Uh, good evening, guys. I am Mukwendeteri Dumela. I'm also a software, full, software, full stack software developer. 
I basically build apps, um, web apps as well. And I'm also good with UI. So I'm happy to help with um, anything uh, that has to do with programming in any language. Thanks. All right, thank you, sir. All right, so we've got uh, just the top code team. Um, there are three. It's it's Lemayne, it's Lerato, and uh, yeah, working from home. And uh, Devo as well. Uh, they're part of the top code team. So Devo, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, hi everyone. So I'm from um, the top code team with Lemayne, Wipilo, and Lerato. And uh, I am more on the development side, uh, particularly Flutter. Uh, that's what we specialize in. So if anyone is interested in a solution that's cross-platform, Flutter, uh, but any any platform really. But um, yeah, that's us. Please do reach out. Thanks. Awesome stuff. Uh, we've got Dr. Paul. Hi everyone, I'm Paul from Policy Action Network. Um, I can help with um, government use cases and also finding data, um, government data that could be used in your applications or data analysis. And we're working with um, Mr. Tselane on the elections topic. So we have a specific interest in election and democracy related data and those kinds of things. So anything related to that, I'm happy to talk more. All right, thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, then we've got Mr. Steve, Steve Jump. Good evening, yes, I'm Steve Jump. And I do lots of things. You know me because I talk about security, secure by design, and how to consider what might possibly go wrong but I am an engineer with experience. That's a euphemism for I've broken an awful lot of things in my career, which means I'm really good at troubleshooting. I am really good at finding excuses, which means I'm pretty good with marketing and business plan preparation. And generally speaking, uh, anything to do with security, risk, privacy, how you manage your data, how you connect your data into your applications. Uh, I won't try and help you with coding, although I could. I think you might get more mileage with the colleagues of, uh, as you just heard from. But I like questions, so please. Uh, I don't necessarily want the abuse, but I would love to get involved in your discussions. If you want to do brainstorming, want to talk about strange stuff, if you want to talk about anything but the hackathon for 10 minutes, I'm your guy, and I'll make the hackathon work as well. That, that's me. Awesome stuff. Yeah, so please um, engage with all the different mentors. Um, I think the last one I have on, on the list, uh, Wipilo is with Top Code. So, Wipilo, I'm not sure if you want to say hi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Wipilo. As Misha has already mentioned, I am from Top Code. I work there as a marketing and sales assistant. So, yes, thank you. Great stuff. Um, then we've got... Um, I'm not sure if Itumileng, are you sorted? Okay, Itumileng is not yet sorted. Uh, Gabriel? Okay, so we've got Gabriel as a mentor is current. Gabriel, you're on mute, sir. All right, um, Gabriel will come back to you. Um, last but not least, we've got Mr. Tiani Ngonyama. Hi, everyone. I'm actually managing the live stream on the other side. But yeah, I'm available. We also have Mr. Mozin Tombella from the CPSI who will be helping you throughout the weekend as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. T. Um, I'll also be available and um, to assist you guys on, on your ideas, so the ideation parts, the business side of things. Um, I'm not sure if I missed any other mentor. Gabriel, are you here? All 
All right. Um, I'll go back to Edu. All right. Um, let's let's move on to to the next part of of the presentation, so we can start um, hacking. All right. So the schedule overview for the weekend for the next coming days looks like this. Um, we're currently on day one, and we're just doing a check in. So please go to your Slack, the Slack channels. There is a form link that has been shared. Uh, we want you guys to just sign to just fill in that form um tell us who you are let's get, it's a way of just getting to know you who you are your favorite colors where are you hacking from um so we are able to, to to just get to know the different people that are taking part um from here on we're gonna move over to slack and where you guys will be um from half past six where we'll be just um hacking and ideating. So it's very important that before you even start hacking, uh, you know, you start coming up with your ideas, polishing your ideas, uh, and engaging the different mentors to help you structure your ideas. By 10 o'clock tonight, we want you guys to submit your team profiles. It is very important for us to have your team profile. So now that you're in a team forming phase, if you already don't have a team, um, by 10 o'clock, let us know by filling in the form, who your team is um, and, and just a bit of details about the team so that we can start preparing for the presentation. On day two, we've got state of the hackathon address. Um, so this is just an update in terms of what's going, what's been happening on the hackathon, uh, you know, feedback, but also uh, what's also on the pipeline. So this is where we'll just give you an overview of what's happening in the pipeline. Um, then 11 to 12, we've got three amazing uh, sessions lined up for you guys. Uh, this I will be in parallel. So you have selected, or if you haven't, you need to select a session which you can take part in and go listen in. We've really got great uh, facilitators for those sessions. Um, and at five o'clock, we get together. So this is just you guys, um, we all coming back and you do a little bit of a quick pitch for us so we can understand what challenges are you facing? You know, where are you stuck? Where can we help you move to the next, to the next side? And then midnight tomorrow, um, that's where the deadline to submit, um, you know, to submit your, 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 your team forms, your, your applicate, your, your, your forms. Um, so we'll just keep you updated and you get a lot of those updates around that. And then the big day on day three, this is where the judging happens. Uh, we will have the first round of judging. So what's going to happen is all the teams will have an opportunity to present. Um, you know, there'll be three groups and you'll have, have an opportunity to present to a set of judges. And um, this will help us do like an elimination round uh, where we'll be able to identify the top 10. So the top 10 will have an, have an opportunity from one o'clock until three o'clock. Uh, to do their final pitches to a uh, panel of judges. And then from three o'clock till half three, you're going to have the prize giving for the hackathon. Right. So this is just an overview of the parallel sessions. Uh, the first one will be focusing on Government 101, Open Data and AI Introduction. This will be done by uh, Dr. Dr. Platinga and Mr. Mabu. Uh, the second one will be on Safe Hack, Secure by Design for those that are interested in cybersecurity or the security side of your solutions, this will be led by um, Ms. Keitu uh, and Mr. Steve Jump. And then the third one is focused on location, services, APIs, uh, data monetization, and business model canvas. And this will be led by the HERE team's uh, uh, team of, um, I mean, sorry, the HERE Technologies team of Ms. Lena and uh, Clint. Right, so we will share the judging criteria with you, but this is just an overview of what it is, uh, things that you'll be judged on. Um, it is going to be very important for you guys to follow the judging criteria when you build your solution to see the areas where you will be judged on um, and pay attention to them. I'll just quickly do an overview. Um, things like technical achievement, um, that gives you 10 points. Um, innovation and novelty, that's 10 points. So this is how original is your idea? Um, you know, so the third one is security and di data privacy. Um, how well has a team adhered to regulation? So um, this is also going to come very much into effect for the team that will be working on um, the elections challenge. So that is 10 points. Presentation as well. How polished is your presentation? We will have a session where we'll take you through uh, presentation and help you guys uh, polish your presentation. That is for five months. Uh, your business case. 
So what we want to do with this hackathon is not just make it a, it ends here and it's a hackathon. We want you guys to work on getting your solutions to market, uh, getting your solutions to people's hands. So um, there will be pointers on your, um, on, on your business case. Then the last one for 10 points is usefulness and an overview of your solution. What is the purpose of the solution? Is the problem identified uh, best addressed with tech solution? Um, it's possible that maybe you've identified a problem and might not need tech. So it's very important to see that. And also, is there an overall wow factor? Does a solution blow your socks off? Um, so let's find ways of blowing the, ju the judge's socks off um, and, um, and, and, and making sure that we, we, we get there. So this is all out of 50 points. Um, so this judging criteria will be shared with all the different teams. Uh, be on the lookout for Slack for all updates from the announcement channel and the networking channel. All right, so we are almost there close to, 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 to the hackathon, but maybe just a quick overview of the challenges. We've got five challenges that we'll be working on um, that the teams will be um, US teams will be required to just be working on. You can pick a challenge. Some of you have already picked um, a challenge. Um, so please just look at the different challenges, um, explore them. If you do not understand, we are available. The Geek Culture team is available to help guide you guys and clarify a few things with regards to the challenge. I'll just quickly give an overview of the five challenges. Um, it is with healthcare access. Uh, you know, we are in the COVID space uh, and, you know, that has messed up a lot of things, especially from our health side of things. So how do we... Um, help the humanity survive through this period uh, through the different health um, solutions and uh, the next one is common society so a greater part of country is still digitally divided and as such um, about to fully participate um, in the digital or internet economy so the, this, this this challenge is more focused on how do we localize build and optimize solutions for mass consumptions so think about the people that are you know, um, don't have access, think about the people that we can help from a common society. The third one is focused on the election, upcoming elections. So with the focus on AI, big data and democracy, um, you know, how do we challenge, uh, it's on a challenge related to election management um, and focused on elections. So how can you better the election process as you had um, earlier on with Mr. Zelani uh, taking us through the election process, what are some of the challenges and opportunities in there? So this is an area where you can work on. Um, then the third one is focused on TVET colleges. Um, there is a big focus in South Africa on traditional universities uh, and not much talk on TVET colleges. So how do we focus on improving TVET colleges, making them have access, bettering their experience uh, while they still impact? Then the last one is building the local geek culture. Um, as geek culture turns eight years old in 2021, um, we are challenging the geeks to build a more inclusive geek culture, enabling collaboration and means for mass digital uh, emancipation. So these are the challenges that you guys will be working on. If you still have any questions around the challenges, uh, we are available to just clarify on them and be able to assist you with them. So that is the end of this part. Uh, we are then going to ask you guys to go back to your Slack channel, start ideating, start ideating and focusing um, before you start coding. There are different mentors available to help you structure everything. So yeah, let the hacking be begin. Let's let's hack the culture. Let's jump onto the different teams that we already are on. Um, ideate. You know, we are available to help you guys start with the first part um, of our dating. If you still need clarity on the challenges, we are available. Um, please do not forget to fill in the, the check-in form on, on Slack. And yeah, let's get into it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone. Um, we have come to the end of this session.
go? Are you ready to 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 go?